Oh, what a blessing. Hey, if you have not yet, grab your Bibles and open with me to our passage. We are in <clears throat> Revelation 13. And if you can, if you would, stand in honor of God's word as we read through this passage and get into our study. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I saw... Oh, I'll wait for the pages to stop shuffling. That's so unique, isn't it? To hear pages still shuffling. That's cool, though. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. <clears throat> its feet were like a bear's and its mouth like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his, his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name, and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all those who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name is not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here's a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. <clears throat> you may be seated. Who's, who's got a favorite place on the globe that they maybe go to often, maybe just hope to go to? Anybody have a favorite place? Whose favorite place is the sea or the seashore? Yeah, there's, I know my wife's hand would go up with that one. You know, especially if you, you grow up there, as Kim did for many years in San Diego. And, you know, if there's, if there's a seaside to be at, I guess San Diego, if you've been there, you know what I'm speaking of. But it's a, it's a pretty pleasant place. But most places are. Now, we prefer the West Coast over the East Coast. We spent some time there. And, um, you know, the, the sand's not like the, the West Coast. And, you know, the waves run the wrong way and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, it, you know... The, the sea can be a, a calming setting, can't it, can it? Anybody go to the beach for the first time in their life and go, oh, this is what those people were talking about, right? You, you, you grow up, you know, say like in a place like this, you got a lot of beach here, but no ocean. <laughs> and, and then you go to the ocean and go, wow, what a calming setting. What, what a place of peace. What a wonderful place to come and visit and, you know, if, if you need to put the suntan or the sun block on, depending on, you know, what age group you're in. And then to, to tuck your toes down in the sand and just kick back and listen to the surf. Listen to the waves after waves. I, I love how Kim, Kim actually wrote a, a little poem, I think, a few years ago and used it at a, a ladies' night thing. But it talked about just the, the grace upon grace as the waves rolled in, you know, and the foam, you know, just cascaded onto the shore. And it's just a, a beautiful picture 
of God's grace, his unending grace. You know, it didn't stop because it's, oh, it's 10 o'clock, you know, we're done. No, it's unending. You know, the, the C, it can be a favorite. But you know, in biblical times, the sea, the big ocean, was a bit of a mystery still. And even for many, it was intimidating and, and certainly not the favorite of many. It was a big, dark place that there was who knows what underneath. And in Scripture, specifically, as we speak of this idea of the sea and we see the beast rising out of it, in Scripture, it often speaks of humanity. Like the, the grains of the sand being the, the multitude of mankind. And even more specifically, the, the scriptures talk about the sea being the, the Gentile nations or the Gentile population that, that is out there in the world. And, and again, as, as we start our passage here, it says that the first beast, knowing that there's a second beast coming, I, I didn't read the second half of the, the chapter that speaks of that. We'll get there I believe next week, but here's the first beast, and, and that term itself is intimidating. It, it, it speaks of, when you look at that, that word in the original, it, it's something that's ghastly, you know, something that you can only imagine really in the, the dark recesses of your worst dreams, that wicked animal or wicked being. Here is this beast that, that comes out of the sea. And, and the description goes on, and, and it, it doesn't get any really more, I guess you could say, average. You know, th this beast has ten horns and seven heads. You talk about a, you know, a two- or three-headed monster and how bad that is, right? And, and yet here is one with ten horns and seven heads. And there are these diadems or these crowns of sorts that are propped upon the horns. And, and along with it come the blasphemous names that are somehow engraved or prominent on the different heads of this beast. Now, if, if this speaks of anything, and we see it clearer and clearer as we go through the chapters, all the way through chapter 19... But if it speaks of anything, it's, it's the, the devil's domain. It, it is this coming false kingdom. They, they would, in some commentaries, they would call it the, the federation of nations. And, and it's a fascinating one to, to peer into. You can, you can find it there, as I alluded to when, when I talked about Daniel. He's got a bunch of information about this false kingdom, the, the domain of the devil. And, and it is, uh, in a sort, it, it's the, the Roman Empire reestablished. Who remembers in history class that the Roman Empire was not taken over? Who remembers that the Roman Empire just kind of dissipated into history? It, it wasn't conquered. It just fell apart, quite literally, from within. Kind of reminds me of another nation. Um, yeah, we're living in it. We're falling apart from the inside. Not that we couldn't be conquered, but it seems like we, we might follow in the, in the shadows of that practice or that, that process that they went through. But this federation also is, is that the end of the statue, you remember again, if you've studied Daniel, if you've peered into that book of prophecy, there's that statue that's described as pure to less pure from the head down to the toes. And, and by the time you get to the toes, it's, it's ten toes, interesting tie here to the ten horns. And, and it's one that's, that's corrupt. It's, it's not made of of solid material. It's a mixture, and that's what makes it so capable and so fragile, capable of being destroyed. But here, we get a really interesting 
picture and, and we get interesting insight into this again reestablished kingdom that the, the devil is going to use. And, and not only the devil, but specifically the devil's man. And it's, it's also the idea that he is this beast. And, and right here, as we go forward in the, the study of Revelation, he specifically takes his place of prominence like never before in this kingdom. He comes in as just one of the kings, if you will, of those different nations that have combined themselves back together. And yet, uniquely, and we saw it this morning already, he comes to a head, quite literally. He comes to a place of prominence. You may remember as we studied back in chapter 6 of Revelation, When those first bits and pieces of the devastation upon this earth, this sin-sick, Christ-rejecting world, one of those four riders was the the white horse rider. And and uniquely, you may remember that he had a bow. No arrows, but he had a bow. He had power. He had authority. and, and, And he went out to, and it says conquer. But he he is here all the more depicted. He's the man with the plan, Hmm. the Antichrist. In verse 2, it goes on and it says that the beast that John saw was like, there's that term again. He's proving once more that he is a, a valley guy, right? For this beast was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now, it's really curious to note, again, tying back to the book of of Daniel and its prophecy, if you know it well, you will see that the lineup here is the reverse of what we see in Daniel from Daniel's perspective. And that's exactly why it's different. Daniel was looking forward into history and seeing the kingdoms that would be set up. Here in Revelation, John is doing the the opposite and he's looking back through history and he's seeing the powers that that came through the kingdoms and it says to the dragon to it excuse me to it that is this beast the dragon remember the dragon is the devil himself this is lucifer all right so the devil gave his power his throne and his great authority to this kingdom. And, and, and more pointedly, what I, I want to have us grasp is uniquely at this exact moment during this age, the tribulation time, the seven-year period. And, and where we seem to find ourselves is smack dab right at the center of that, three and a half years into it. Another prophecy being fulfilled right here is the prophecy of how that man of sin will come in. And it says there in Daniel 9 that he will make a covenant with the nation Israel. And yet in the midst of that covenant, it says specifically he'll make a covenant with them for one week. Well, we know it's not seven days, but it's a heptad. That's the word week. And that is a week of years, seven, a seven year period. And the Antichrist comes in, the man of sin, the man with the plan. And he, he makes up or he makes this covenant with the nation of Israel. And right in the center of it, right at the, the throes of it, he says, enough is enough. I've given you time to do your thing. Now you're going to do my thing. And, and he comes into, again, all the more this place of prominence. <clears throat> At this time, Satan's motivated to bring about not just this false kingdom, but the false trinity, the anti-trinity. We, we've called the man of sin the anti-Christ. You know what that word means? It, it doesn't just mean to be against. You can be 
anti-abortion or anti-whatever. You can be against something. But anti also means to be in the place of, to be a substitute for. And, and here at this moment, Satan comes in motivated to present the false Godhead, the false trinity. And he begins with the Antichrist, this man of sin. He is also called in Daniel's prophecy, the little horn. It's, a, it's an interesting description. There's seven heads and ten horns. Well, if you go back, there's actually... Ten horns and ten heads, and yet the little horn rises up, and it says, takes three of them down. And it says, quite literally, that he has them in his mouth. That is, that he has overcome them. And that's, that, that is speaking of specifically of this rise to prominence. And he comes on the scene, and he speaks, as again, Daniel directs or gives insight to, he speaks pompous words. We, we read about those words in our passage this morning. It's here at this midpoint in the tribulation that his power uniquely, and, and we will see, we've read it, we'll, we'll look at it now, why that takes place, why there is that advantage, if you will, that he takes full advantage of. His position ramps up. You could say that having been the influencer, that the devil, not just wanting to influence this man the first three and a half years, he wants to be, well, in full possession of him. It it, it morphs into this diabolical demoniac, if you will. Verse 3, it says that one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Okay, so here, here's one of the kings of those that ten kingdom or ten, ten king nations. It's one of them that, that has this mortal wound. And, and if you look into that, that term, mortal wound, it's not like, it's not a, a grazing wound. You know, it's, it's not a little owie. What this signifies is that this horn, this man, re- received a wound of some sort that caused him to perish. It's a wound that brings death. But its mortal wound was healed. Isn't that fascinating? That this king that, that comes to prominence through a battle of some sort, he, he takes over three of the other kingdoms, and he, and he pushes himself out into the front of the limelight. And then in the process of that, there's some conflict that they, someone comes against him. And literally, we hear that it's the wound of a sword. And if you go, if you dig into that prophecy, it's fascinating. There's one in, I believe it's in, in Ezekiel that speaks of his right eye and his right arm being affected. His right eye is blinded. His right arm is is depleted. It can't be used. And yet he has come back from this place of death. And what happens? <laughs> Not only does he come on the scene, but then the whole world marvels. They are in awe. They are overcome by this one. You know, it's fascinating to note is what Jesus said to the Jewish people. In the latter part of his ministry to them, as he sought to reach their hearts, he said, I've come in my father's name and and you would not receive me. Another will come in his own name and him you will receive. Here's that one that comes on the scene and and the Jewish people will say, hey, you're our man. Hey, you're going to allow us to have our temple and and do our our worship through the years. You're you're our man. We're going to accept you as our authority. They marvel 
as they follow the beast and they worship the dragon. For he had given his authority to the beast. So, so see, there's where we see the transition. That this, this man of sin that started out as just a king and influenced by the devil is now fully empowered by him. Having even faked a death or even been given the opportunity to come back to life. See the, the false godhead there? What did Jesus, the Son of God, do for mankind? He died, and yet he came back to life. See, the devil wants to replicate that in his own authority, with his own power. <clears throat> we see this counterfeit resurrection. It's alluded to just a couple of chapters ago in 11.7 talks about the beast coming out of the pit, coming out of death's gates. But isn't it amazing that not only do they marvel, but it says here that they worship the beast. This is a term that's, that's as Ryan even alluded to this morning, something that should be unique to the household of God. Now, I understand that mankind, we can tend to worship a lot of things, can't we? We can worship the bank account. We can worship that, that position of prestige. We can worship a person, a child. And yet, uniquely as believers, we are called to and given the opportunity to Worship our God and our King, our Savior and our Lord. But here at this moment in time in humanity, they will worship the false God. They, they will run after him, it says, and be amazed at him. Who is like, look at it, look at it says at the end of verse 4, who is like the beast and, and who can fight against him? Man, he's conquered death. He's come back to life. This guy is the cat's meow. You guys haven't heard that one in a while, huh? Some of you guys are going, cat's meow? What, what? Yeah, well, it's an old saying. Look it up. But that's how they're going to be approaching this man. This horn that's come to prominence. It's fascinating to, to hear what the Apostle Paul said of him. That he comes on the scene and, and he does these signs and wonders. But then it says specifically in, in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that the, the people here on earth at this time who don't know Christ, who don't come to a, a saving knowledge of him, they will be given over to a delusion that they might believe the lie. God's basically going like he did to Pharaoh. Okay, <laughs> you don't want to believe the signs that I've put before you. You don't want to come by faith and surrender your life to me. Then here, you will be given over to these things. And mankind at this time will surrender themselves. They will submit themselves. Oh, how important it is. If, if you're here this morning and you have not, truly have not surrendered your heart and your life, opened yourself to the relationship that God has provided through Christ. If that's not happened yet, folks, I'm no prophet, but I know this, that the time of the end is sooner than it was last week. And, and this is not, here, here's another one for you. This is not a time to lollygag. Ooh, there's a, there's a good one, right? Yeah. I, I heard that from some other folks I know. <laughs> to lollygag, to, to sit back and, you know, to say, hey, I got time. I got my youth. I've got, you know, again, I've got a pocketbook that's full. I've got a career that's, well, it's hard in this community to say that we've got careers that are, you know, going gangbusters, but... Hey, I've got a career. 
Hey, I've got a family to raise. Hey, I've got... But if you miss, if you miss coming to faith in Jesus and, and the end comes upon and, and the church is caught up and, and you're left behind, you will face some dire, dire times. So the most difficult times. Who's seen the, who's seen the, the movie Unbroken? Who's cried? A few times in that movie. Yeah. It's pretty intense. And what amazed me, Kim and I watched it just the other night, what amazed me in the midst of all of the, the dynamics of his life is that he didn't know Jesus through all of that and yet endured nonetheless. He didn't come to Jesus until many years after the war when he had really all the more devastated his life with drinking and, and ruinous living. And yet he finally did. But as I, I took in that movie, and it was like, man, alive. That's a guy that, that did it in this world without the Lord. And, and, and what he did was endure suffering. That's really the bottom line of what he did. He didn't suffer for anything but his connection to this nation at wartime. But he endured. But I thought of those things that he went through, and it's like, whew, there's some parallels to what people are likely to go through, people that do dare to say, I'm not taking the mark. I will not submit myself to this man of sin. In fact, I am stepping aside. I'm becoming chosen. I'm becoming a, a holy one of God, a child of the living God. And for those folks, this time will be the hardest of them. <laughs> My encouragement is that you don't wait. Don't wait to see how it pans out, to see, you know, if you can get to that next level, to see if you can come to adulthood and, and then I'll give my life. No, today is the day. Now is the time. For these times are, are soon upon us. And, and if that's another decade or another 50 years, it's still soon. Today is the day. Don't wait. Don't set yourself up for being given over to the delusion that will set in this world. Verse 5, it says that the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Again, we're reminded of the time frame here. It's the, the latter three and a half years. That's 42 Jewish calendar months. But I want us to note something that's so important here. Even though we will not, as the church, be going through this time, as I understand it, as I believe the Bible teaches it, this is a good thing to know even for us now in this life. Notice, number one, he's given a mouth and it is allowed, the beast is allowed to exercise this authority. My point, he is still under the control of God. Even though it would seem that he is out of a control or the world that he sets before his kingdom that he sets up is out of control. He is still under the control of God. There is this limited ability that he is, he's given. He's given a mouth. He is allowed to exercise this authority. You know, Jesus said something fascinating about these days. I, I think I've probably already mentioned it in our study of Revelation, but it's good to to hear again, and that is, if these days had not been shortened, no flesh would survive. Isn't that good to know? That he's got this under control. God's not gone, oh, I let the cat out of the bag. There's another one. 
Man, I'm full of them this morning. It's not as though God has gone, oh my goodness, how are we going to get this back together? No. Very pointedly, God has allowed these things. He's permitted them, and yet he's limited them in their scope, in their, even their time frame. Verse 6 goes on and it says that the beast opened its mouth and it uttered blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. You know, we just read last week that he was kicked out of glory, right? The devil was finally banished from the throne of God. Through the ages, he's had some sort of, again, limited though it was, he's had some access to God. And yet, we read that finally, with Michael at the helm, he is beaten out of heaven, never to be able to return. You ever been rejected or refused entrance? Where's your heart go? Mine usually goes, I'm going to find a way. I'm getting back in there, right? Right? Some of mine is the, the wicked, wickedest memories of, of my youth getting kicked out of a bar when I was underage and going, okay, got to come up with a better false ID. I'm going to get back in there. How foolish I was. And, and we see that the heart of that foolishness in the heart of the devil. He blasphemes God and he, and he blasphemes. He derides and ridicules Believers. Couldn't be there anymore, but man, he's going to shout it from the rooftops as far as he can. He's going to put it on the front page of whatever paper he has influence over. To speak poorly and, again, wickedly. Haughty words, it says. Blasphemous words against God and God's people. We see that though his time is short, and he knows it, he here now, in this limited time, he will pursue the greatest of destruction on the souls of men. (laughs) And he'll do it, he'll do much of it through deception. You know, that's the the work of the devil, isn't it? He deceives. He's the deceiver. He's deceived from the very start. What what was his first deception in the garden? Surely God didn't say, right? Oh, you got him wrong. Certainly. You, you, You really didn't understand. And the devil from the start was after the hearts, the souls of men through his deceitful works. Folks, he he does it the same way today, doesn't he? Oh, the grass is greener on the other side. If I get rid of her, I can get me a better one. And, And I know that may be a little coarse in thinking of the marriage relationship, but the devil's right in the throes of a conversation like that, isn't he? Oh man, I can I can outdo this person. I can undercut here. I can deceive the government. You well, know, you may, but you won't deceive God. He will not be mocked. <clears throat> Nor by man, but especially even by the devil. God will not be mocked. Verse 7 goes on and again it's that he was allowed The beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Authority was given it over every tribe and people, language and nation. That brings up an an interesting thought, doesn't (coughs) doesn't it? It says that he made war on the saints. 
You know, there's, there's three different groups of people throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament, that are defined by or given the name of saints. You know what saints are? Do you know if, if you believe in Jesus today, you are a saint? Isn't that a, amazing? I, I thought that was blasphemous talk when I first came to Christ because I came from a, a Catholic background that, man, you had to go through the Pope to become a saint. Hello? How, how could the Bible say that you are saints? Well, to be a saint is simply to be one who has been set apart. Set apart by the work of the gospel message. It's a holy one. That's what the word holy means, to be set apart. Holy unto God, set apart unto him. Are you a saint today? Well, in the Old Testament, the saints, the holy ones, were the Jewish people. They were called saints. Those that God uniquely set apart for a unique work to, to be shown off to the rest of the tribes of the, the world, the nations of the world. But then we come into the New Testament and just about every letter that Paul writes, he says it's to the saints in a certain city, to those holy ones, those that have come by faith to know Jesus personally. So there's another category. We would call it the church. The church is... A bunch of saints. Yes, we are still in the, the process of being sanctified and therefore dealing with our sin, but we are also saints. And then the third group of folks that's given this title, and it's here found in Revelation. Saints. Now, let me, let me say this, that... <clears throat> If, if this is the church, as some would, would try to argue, can I dare say, I will dare say, then Jesus lied. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples, Peter pipes up and says, you're the son of God. Jesus responds to him and he says, man, Pete, praise the Lord. The Spirit of God's been actually working through you, buddy. <laughs> That's a paraphrase, but his point was, Peter, you've told the truth. And then what did Jesus say? And upon this rock, I will found my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Guys, that, that's an argument that I often, as the pastor of this church, put up and put out to us as our need to be inside these walls occasionally. Not religiously. Please, don't do it religiously. Do it unto the Lord. But come together. Because Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what? If you want to be a solo guy out there on your own, what do they call a, a lone ranger, spiritually speaking, do you think you can, you know, speak of the church, oh, you're just a bunch of hypocrites, I'm going to go do my church out in nature, I'm going to do my church online, I'm going to do my church, you know, disconnected because, man, the church is just such a bother, well, Jesus said that his church, the gospel message at work in the body of believers, that is where the devil and the gates of hell would not prevail. Folks, when, when we get that lone ranger syndrome and we think we don't need the body, we can do it fine on our own. Man, you know, we've got a big enough family to call ourselves a church, whatever the, the mindset. You know what we become out in our own field <laughs> we become easy pickings for the devil but when we come together when we find the unity of love the bond of peace yeah it's here and again i'm not saying i take take note when you're not here you, you probably notice if if you haven't been here for a week or two i, I may not even call 
And some people have gotten bugged by that. But I figure, you know, if this is where God's calling you, then the Holy Spirit's going to call you <laughs> and encourage you to be here in the midst of the body. <clears throat> For these saints that we, we hear of here in Revelation, we would call them the, the tribulation saints. <coughs> Those that come into a relationship with God uniquely after the church has been taken up through the rapture. For these saints, man, as I've already pointed out, these are not going to be times of ease. They will literally be running for the hills. You know, we, we, we know of a thing, if you've done any type of, you know, history on the church presently, and it's been going on for decades, but there is an underground church. And, and I don't mean when I say that, that they're tunneling through the towns, although some of them literally do meet underground. But I speak of those saints that have to, because of the tyrannical authority over them and the governments in which we live and the countries in which they live, they need to, to find themselves coming together in secret. Because to do it publicly means, well, <laughs> the demise of the building. I think it was just last year, I, I read an article from Voice of the Martyrs. In China, churches being bulldozed. A church like this. Could you imagine? The government coming in and, and putting this building and the others to the ground. Raising them. It's always been a weird term to me, but... To raise means to lower or to destroy. But could you imagine in, in our country to, to hear of that going on? But it's happening in, in dozens of other countries in this world today. How much more so when the devil gets a foothold as he will in these days? Uniquely challenging it will be to believe, to, to stand for Christ. I guess I point that out, or at least one of the reasons I point that out is because, you know, we can, we can be pretty wimpy in our world today, can't we, as believers? Can't we? Oh, they don't like that I have a Bible. They don't like that I pray at the restaurant. Now, no one's ever said anything, but the devil has, has put some thoughts in your mind. Oh, she looked at me because I was praying at the restaurant. Oh, they must not like me. Well, maybe it's because they would rather have you invited them over for prayer or ask them what they need prayer for in their life. You know what's fascinating is, is the gospel. <laughs> the gospel is the only thing that can fill the God-shaped void in all of humanity. Now, we go looking... Again, we go looking in a lot of different places to fill it. We try to fill it with stuff, <laughs> love, false love in this world, relationships of all sorts, money, prestige, again, all of those things. And yet none of them can fill as only the gospel is uniquely made to be able to fill that void. And the world's looking for it, folks. They thirst for it. Even though they might not even know that. But if we dare to stand, and, and again, it's so easy for us. Even still, as, I mean, I, <clears throat> Calvary chapels have been unique in this time, and that is that, you know, there's been a, a Supreme Court case that's gone, unfortunately, south. But that one of the first Supreme Court cases about the closing of churches involved the Calvary Chapel in Nevada. And they made their case and they went up against the casinos or at least the, the regulations that were given to the casinos. And unfortunately, at that time, we didn't have the advantage that we seem to have at this point in the Supreme Court with conservative thinking. 
And they, they, they quelched it. They're like, no, the government there in Utah or um, Nevada, they can do what they want. They want to diminish. You know, we've got, we've got two churches that I know of in our state that were just fine just a few weeks ago. $10,000 a piece for one service of being open. I know another Calvary Chapel in, in my hometown of San Jose, California. They have a bill from the county, Santa Clara County, of over $800,000 that continues to mount every Sunday, every time they meet. Yeah, they, they might not be knocking down buildings, but they're, <laughs> they're pounding on the doors. And, and if, if the antics of our own government our own state government, government, our own governor presently, if those antics are anything, they're to scare us. They're to cause us to run for the hills, to find the shadows that, that we would not do what we're doing this morning. And folks, as you look at these saints, that the devil himself and his man of power is going to come against and make war, and yet they're going to stand their ground. And though these saints, they may lose their lives, (laughs) what the devil will not be able to take, he will not be able to destroy the spiritual life that they have in the Lord. And that's true for us as well. The devil can't take our soul if we're in Jesus. If we know the Lord, he might take this flesh. What did Paul say from prison? He goes, man, I don't know. To die? Gain. Not to stay here is gain for you, but I'm I'm in a quandary. What to do? Should I want to stay here and continue? Yeah, that would benefit the church, but man, to, to have to put aside this tent... Whew, that means glory. Hello? You know, Kim has said it a number of times, especially since cancer. It's like, we're going to get to heaven and go, man, why all the vitamins? <laughs> what in the world were we thinking? Kale? Just to get another week out of this world? I've got 10 minutes and there's a powerful point I I need to bring home. And it's with what comes next in verse 8. In some ways I feel like that robot. Here it goes. I'm going to go back again. Lost in space. Warning, Will Robinson. Warning. Anybody? Yeah. It it had the weirdest hands, right? Warning. Whoa, my knee almost went out. (laughs) Definitely not a robot. (laughs) <laughs> but as we look at verse 8 and I'm going to read it through again in, in ESV and then the, the New King James the issue is a, a doctrinal issue that comes up here and, and you may or may not have noticed it it may have just kind of gone right over and yet it's a Calvinistic approach or it, it tends to be, or, or lends itself to this Calvinistic idea that is implied through the translation. And yet it's not warranted. And, and, and I think, I, well, what I'm going to attempt to do is, is reveal why. Again, verse 8, it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, speaking of the beast, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If you read the ESV with me this morning, that's what you read. Who does not have the ESV and read something different this morning? Okay. New King James. I'll read that now. Same verse. Starts starts very similar. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Do you see the very different emphasis here? <clears throat> the ESV, in my estimation, it, it brings in this doctrinal push. 
the ESV states the names were written before the foundation. New King James talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. Even a different word, before and from. You know, there's a big difference in those terms, before and from. Before goes way beyond the foundation, but from starts at that point. Here, I believe that the, the case, there is a case where the translation here it seems to bring with it a bit of an agenda, a doctrinal agenda. And, and what I found is, it, as I did as much studying as I could, well, maybe not as much, but quite a bit of studying on this passage, that the, the Greek, the original Greek structure of this statement it's got a preposition in it. It's A-P-O, apo. And it means from. It doesn't mean before. There, there's other Greek words that are, that are used and translated before. It means from. And, and, and that preposition in the, the Greek structure is tied to the lamb and not the, the names. And so when you... You have these different translations. You see that, man, you, you can go down a very different path. You, you can come up with a, a very different understanding of things. Now, I want to bring you another verse. It's, it's one that we will look at later in this same book. But I want to bring you it because it's, it's from the ESV. And it shows you that they weren't consistent in their translation. The same word, okay? This is Revelation 17, verse 8. The ESV reads, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel. That word is the same word, but they translated it different. No longer before, but now it's from. I, I bring that up again primarily because we see the inconsistencies. Now, I, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but we went to the ESV primarily. This was a few years ago. Um, we started teaching through the New Testament again, and, and I thought, hey, you know what? We're going to take on the ESV. It was promoted through um, pastors' conferences that I was at. You know, the, some things were talked about and, and made clear. My point in bringing this out is that translations matter, and with the translation comes sometimes come this angle. You know, because behind the translation there's a a a litany of usually a, a very long list or at least a good list of scholars that come to the table to make the translation and, and bring it to us in English. And it's important for us to take note. Now, I have no problem, note this, I have no problem that, that God knows, He foreknows. You know God knows more than you? Please say amen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, God foreknows. I, I, I like the simple, maybe simplistic picture in my mind it's a scroll you know for us the scroll it begins with Adam and Eve in the garden and it's unraveled to this very moment in time from, from our perspective as humanity but do you know what the scroll looks like to God it's completely unfurled he knows the from the yeah he knows he foreknows God's ability I, I, I know it's not mine and I have no problem with it. The issue that I have is, again, the Calvinistic doctrinal stance that there is this determination, determinism in their own word. And, and to think other, otherwise of this doctrinal stance, Calvin even would say of those who didn't agree with him that they're foolish, they're childish in their thinking spiritually. 
Bottom line, the idea behind determinism, God chose. Tied into this verse, God chose before the foundation of the world. What did God choose? Well, if you get into it, go listen to some of John Piper. Go listen to some of MacArthur. Go listen to some pretty prominent spokesman in the church today, and you will hear them say, God has chosen everything. He's determined everything. The shift in your seat just now over the, the nervousness maybe about this issue, God determined that. The clothes you put on this morning, God has determined that. He is the all-knowing one. Therefore, he has determined everything that ever goes on. Do you know what that includes? Hitler's actions. You know what that also includes? The abortion clinic's antics, their behavior towards the unborn. God determined that. See where it gets a little scary? <clears throat> you know, there's an indication as you study the books that are mentioned in the scripture. And I'm not speaking of the Bible books, but books that are in God's hands. We're going to see the books that are opened at the second, revela- or the second resurrection. Books are opened. And you know, there is some indication that all names of all humanity are in the books. They're written there. And they're only snuffed out or blotted out, as the biblical term goes, when one refuses to receive salvation. Now, this verse here, again, the reason I bring it up and make an issue of it, it is, it is along with many others, used as a proof text for Calvinistic predestination God predetermined before the foundation of the world you're, you for heaven and you for hell eeny meeny miny mo type of thinking and, and I know again that's pretty simplistic but they would really present a God that's arbitrary in his choosing of the souls for not just heaven Calvin taught that God chose some for damnation Is that the God of the Bible? Is that the God that you've come to know? An arbitrary God kind of flipping a coin going, well, no, you're going to hell. I have predetermined it. Now, folks, the Bible teaches predestination. But you know what it it teaches predestination? Or do you know who specifically it speaks of being predestined? To be conformed into the image of Christ. You know who gets predestined for that? Those who come to faith in Jesus. We are predestined therefore. You come into that relationship with with God through the gospel. And there is this predestination. It's, It's as though the message of the gospel is the train. You got your ticket to ride. You know, there's another old one. But you get on the train by receiving the gospel, allowing it to be become personal. Guess what? Before you were on the train, you weren't bound for glory. But once you stepped onto it by faith, you were predestined to go to heaven. <clears throat> the Bible makes very clear throughout its pages That God's saving grace is extended to all of mankind. We sang it this morning. Not on purpose. I didn't know what songs Dylan was going to put on the list this morning. But I thought, hey, look at that. All who believe. All who come by faith to believe in Jesus. As with Abraham in the Old Testament. Remember what it says about him? That because he believed in what God had promised, not even fulfilled. Remember, he was looking forward to when the cross would come, when Christ would come down and and redeem sinful souls. And, And yet just Abraham, it says, his believing in that, 
It was acquired or appointed or understood to be his righteousness. Now, please understand this, because this is where Calvinists will come in and say, that's a work. Your belief is a work. No, it's not. No. This does not mean that we, that is our faith, are, are trusting in what God has declared to be saving grace. That does not mean that we merit our own salvation. My responding, you know why we're going to be responsible to God? Is because we have the choice to respond. If we're, if we're just robots, which I was a bad example of, right? But if we're just robots, how can God dare to hold us accountable for what he has deemed us to be? Damned for hell. How would God be a, a righteous judge if he went, you're going to hell, now I'm going to hold you accountable and you're going to be punished for that. Guys, it doesn't fit scripture. It's by grace alone, amen? Through faith alone in Christ alone. Praise God. And you know what's incredible? God's sovereignty you know what sovereignty is? God's sovereignty, his authority over. God's sovereignty includes giving man free will. It includes it. I love this. If you're not a Tozer reader, become one. Here's a great quote from Tozer. God sovereignly decreed that man should be free to exercise moral choice. And man, from the beginning, has fulfilled that decree by making his choice between good and evil. And when he chooses to do evil, he does not thereby countervail the sovereign will of God, but fulfills it, inasmuch as the eternal decree decided not which choice the man should make, but that he should be free to make it. Man's will is free because God is sovereign. And I love this end. A God less than sovereign could not bestow moral freedom upon his creatures. He would be too afraid to do so. a reminder for us as I conclude this point it's a good reminder for us to be like the Bereans it, it, it's not just because it's a sweet little name or a cool little ditty that we, we named our coffee shop and bookstore the Berean bean you won't find self help books in there by the way because we can't help ourselves, amen? It, it's God who helps us. But this is a good reminder as we look at the depths of Scripture and the doctrinal differences that people have. And, and please understand, I'm not saying that, although John Piper, I'd like to kick him in the tail end for what he declared before the election. I think he was a fool for, for saying hey, don't vote for this guy because he's a sinner. It's like, okay, then we can't vote for anyone. But I'm not saying that John Piper's going to hell, okay? I think there's going to be a learning curve for many of us to go, hmm, I got to spend eternity with this guy. Okay, <laughs> God help me. <laughs> Guys, we need to be Bereans. <clears throat> When it gets down to it, back in the passage, it's, it is mind-boggling that those that do not have spiritual discernment will worship the beast, amen? They're going to go after the devil in gaiety, in all sorts of just emotionally led affairs. 
What I find fascinating is as we close, the last couple of verses really clear up some things. You know, the 2020 vision that you like to have, I don't have anymore, as you can note. But we talk about spiritual 2020 vision. You know, you come into a, an issue, a doctrinal one, you go, hmm, I wonder. Well, read 20, 20 verses before that issue and 20 verses after. And most of the time, there will come 2020 vision. You'll get some clarity. As verse 9, I think, does. It says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Unfortunately, believe it or not, again, I'm, I'm not, well, I guess I kind of am harping on Calvinists this morning. But Calvinists would come in and say, well, the anyone is the chosen. The anyone is those that God has you know, predestined. No, it says, if anyone. That's what the scripture says. It says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And I love what the Spirit says here. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, with the sword must he be slain. You might look at that and go, that's confusing. It's like, rah, rah, let's go die. But really what what we find here is the comfort from the Lord. Comfort for us, yes, in, in today's environment that's getting more and more intense towards true believers. It's really not gone anywhere compared to where it could go. Again, compared to the underground church and many other nations. You think we have it difficult here now? We should be being readied But there's encouragement here because, again, Satan and sinners will not go unnoticed, folks. The devil's got, (laughs) he's got a mind to bring destruction. God's got the ledger that's kept all those things. And he will, ultimately, he will cause to not just have man, sinners, but the devil himself. And his man, they will give an account. John concludes with an exhortation to those who walk by faith. Says there at the end of verse 10. Here's a call for endurance and faith of the saints. We talked about that one word many times whenever it comes up. It's such a good one. It's hupomone. It's staying powder, power. Endurance, maybe translation, translated patience, patient endurance. God's doing, desiring to do a deeper work in us, and we dare not, we should not desire to step away from it and go, ah, not me, not today, not in this situation, God, come on. But rather, as John puts out the encouraging challenge here is to, Lord, I want to stay under this. It's tough. This is no fun. This hurts. <coughs> I think it hurts because we're holding on to stuff that's not of the Lord. And we need to let go of those things that they would fall away and that we would be purified more and more, sanctified even still. Amen? Here is a note. Here's a call to us, the saints. Certainly he may be speaking to those who will live for Jesus in these days, but he definitely is speaking to us today. This is not the time, though it is tempting in our times to cave in, to bow out, to back up, to again forsake the assembling of the fellowship. Now, please, I understand there's, there are folks that need to stay away. They're taking care of the elderly. They're in certain positions that they need to not be here presently. But don't let that become your excuse. Oh man, it's so nice to be able to just drink my coffee, not have to iron anything and sit back under my nice little comforter. That can't be the norm for those that walk by faith. It's time not to sit back, but to press in. It's time for us not to give up the fight, but to press in all the more. Amen? Father, we thank you so much. God, we thank you for, God, the grace.
that does extend and has extended to us. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for, Lord, your, your kids right here, your sons and daughters, Lord, my brothers and sisters, people of faith. Father, I, I hold us up to you. And dear God, I pray that uniquely and powerfully and purposefully, God, that you will instill in us, Lord, the truths of, yes, this passage, but, but of all of your word and, and, God, your heart and your spirit. God, come alive in us all the more. And God, give us a daringness, Lord, to go out and to speak to the, the last, the least, the lost that are all around us. And Father, as I close, if, if there is but one here that has not begun a relationship with you, has not opened their, their hearts, their lives to you to, to receive the gospel, the good news, that they don't have to pay the penalty or try to for their sin, but Lord, you did. And if there is but one that needs to come into that relationship and God to walk with you, to begin to, Lord, Walk by faith. God, even now, Lord, let them, God, respond in faith to what you have done, to what you have accomplished for themselves, for, Lord, the world, that you so loved the world, that you gave your son, that whoever would believe would not perish, but have eternal life. God, we thank you for that truth. We bless you, Lord. God, have your way. For your glory, let it be. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand in worship.